those as well, but I've been informed that some of them may not work, so uh, I will just uh, distribute those uh, and then in, in a process maybe we will have some more, but I am, I am not sure. Uh, so if you have laptops and you want to follow basically uh, with me, uh, you can. So is it possible to download it from my laptop? Uh, it's like 2.3 gigabytes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it is possible, but it will take a while. Uh, is a BIOS binary, and then a third file is a startup script. Uh, basically, uh, all you have to do is uh, just start the script. It will start uh, QEMU KVM uh, virtual machine with uh, the disk image provided and BIOS image, uh, which is also on the flash drive. Can I Go ahead. Uh, so, hi guys, let me introduce you to this workshop. Uh, which will be done by Michal Sekletar and it will be about introduction to UFI application development. Uh, please ask questions. Uh, Mi Michal can give you these scarves if you are active enough, so please do. Also, evaluate the session. You can let us know about your opinion on Twitter or post the blog. Uh, also, I would like to remind you that tomorrow is great contest uh, and, and in the end of the DevCon. And you can get some awesome prizes like Raspberry Pi, YubiKeys, which are for, you know, YubiKeys. <laughs> uh, and that's also, please enjoy. Thank you for the introduction. So, yeah. Uh, I have a That, I, I will get to that. Uh, okay, so let me start with the first slide, <laughs> which is basically your question. Yes, uh, I mean, it depends. It depends on your firmware and your platform. I will take no responsibility for any bricked machines during this <laughs> workshop, so that's why we have VM image and we will be doing the work in a, in a virtual environment because yeah, I mean, it's every time you interact with the firmware, it may, it may work. I mean, it, it should work, but in a real life, there are some vendors which screw up and then you will break your machine. So first, every time you do something like that, like, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, writing to EFI variables or updating the firmware, Check first on on uh, forums on the man, on your on OEM or manufacturer website whether it is safe because I I can't tell I can't tell it depends on the platform so yeah uh, we will be we will be using the VM image because it is it is safer to do it this way so uh, like I said on that uh, on that uh, flash drive you have three files. So it's basically a disk image, BIOS binary, and startup script. Uh, script is that simple, it's only just a uh, shortcut to call QEMU. Uh, so yeah, let me first tell you what uh, will be the contents of this workshop. So the title is Introduction to UEFI Development, which is sort of a bit misleading because it is not only about the development because I don't think it like makes sense to do some live coding in, in this workshop. Uh, I, I think that, uh, and it doesn't make sense to do that as well because I have no idea who actually has some uh, prior experience with UEFI and uh, C, uh, C language and has, well, well, basically some prior experience with programming. So th there will be some uh, something co like 
development work at the end of the workshop, but before that I will, I will uh, start with some other things. So first I will show you uh, some uh, secure boot uh, demo. Then uh, I will talk about briefly about legacy BIOS. Uh, I will clarify vocabulary a bit. I will be using in this workshop because there is a lot of terms floating around. Everybody is using <coughs> similar terms to address different things. So I will clarify what I mean uh, <coughs> by, <coughs> by what, basically. Then I will talk briefly about UEFI. Then uh, I will talk about Secure Boot more and actually show you step by step, uh, step by step uh, how you can how you can uh, basically take over your own machine because, okay, so how you can take over your own machine and how you can use Secure Boot for your own benefit. And then we will get to do UEFI development, which will, uh, where I will address like how to, uh, how to set up uh, a basic environment. What do you need to actually write Hello World application, which can run directly on top of the firmware. What, the, what build tools, what, uh, what other tools are necessary because it is a bit different than, uh, well, basically uh, the C, uh, G GCC normal wo workflow. It, it, so it, this image is important just for development? Uh, uh, th this, that image contains secure boot stuff as well as, so, so it, you can use it for secure boot uh, set up and, and the demo and uh, UEFI development tools are also installed and inside that image in a root home directory, uh, root user home directory is actually uh, very small UEFI applications, basically hello world example and that there is a script which will set up secure boot on, on that uh, on the uh, VM. <coughs> So that that image should address like both things, secure boot as well as uh, UEFI development. So okay, I, I will start with the demo because I think it is, at least I think it is interesting to see first where we wanna get to and okay, so let me ask, who knows what is secure boot? Okay, a couple of people. And who thinks it's a bad thing? Or who? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so I will use the same, basically the same script as you have. So I started the VM. Okay, you can see it. So <coughs> this is my uh, this is the bootloader environment that is actually systemd boot uh, bootloader. So I have Fedora Rawhide in uh, in that image. So let me start uh, Rawhide. Hopefully it will start, and it should be quick because it's systemd inside. Yeah, it's quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, by the way, a uh, password for a root user is Red Hat, and there is also a test user, and uh, the password is the same, so Red Hat. Okay, so like I said, in a directory of the root a user, you can see a hello world example, then there is a secure boot demo, and some Fedora CA certs, you don't have to uh, be bothered with those. I left them because uh, I would like to be able to boot uh, kernel signed by Fedora signing keys. So, and uh, if you accidentally delete Fedora key, it's not that easy to recover that key because, well, it's just not that easy. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so secure boot demo. Now, let me show you that currently, okay, so. For, for systemd boot uh, bootloader, we have a command line tool called bootctl. Uh, it has a couple of top level 
verbs basically like st status install update and remove uh, if you don't provide any parameters it will do status so it, it is going to tell you uh, which version of uh, UEFI firmware you have uh, what is the current secure boot mode uh, and a couple of other uh, important informations so as you can see my loader is uh, system boot and yeah and secure boot is actually now disabled and platform is in setup mode what those things mean uh, I will get to that so I will just run ah, okay so yeah it requires test setup script requires one parameter it is just uh, it will be used as a part of a distinguished name for uh, generation of certificates. So it generated some certificates, and printed some debug output, uh, and it enrolled uh, keys into the firmware. Uh, as you can see, I have a couple of keys enrolled, and I have Fedora Secure Boot uh, CA key enrolled as well. So I don't have to resign my kernel L and all uh, kernel modules. It's in EFI? Yes, yeah. okay. they, they are uh, actually enrolled in an EFI firmware. So now I should have... Oh. I should have... Uh, systemd boot uh, x64 EFI. Uh, and that is actually, you'll see, here is the unsigned version, and here is the signed version of the bootloader. So I signed bootloader with the key I just generated, basically. And now I can I can copy the bootloader to the final destination, uh, which is uh, which is boot EFI system D. Uh, so I will overwrite what's currently there. Okay, that should be it. Now if I reboot the machine. Okay, so first thing, I was able to launch a bootloader. That's a good thing because now secure boot should be enabled and enforced. So that means that my bootloader is uh, correctly signed with, with the correct keys. So I can now launch... Fedora, Rawhide, and it seems like, okay, so it started up, so that means also that uh, Fedora keys is properly enrolled in a EFI firmware because I didn't do anything like resigning of the kernel, so Fedora keys is in there. That's why I was able to boot that, uh, boot that kernel. And now if I run boot CTL, I can see that secure boot is enabled and uh, I am actually in a user mode. Uh, I will cover secure boot modes uh, during the presentation. So now I can look in a system keyring and I should see that uh, yeah, so I have my own keys and Fedora key in a, syst uh, in a system keyring so no Microsoft key, no Lenovo key, no no uh, no other keys than this. So no one else is basically able to to uh, load any malware into my into my uh, kernel. Basically, no uh, also no boot kit uh, malware should be able to uh, succeed on on such a setup because uh, unless somebody stole my keys, right, and assigns malware with my keys. Okay, so that or unless somebody. Utility and it lies to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, what KQL prints is true. Hmm? Uh, come again? I, I didn't get that. Well, boot KQL said to you that the secure boot is enabled and the setup mode is user. How do you know that this is true, not the fiction created by this binary? Well, it reads, uh, you know, it by looking at this. Uh, it reads. Letters on the screen? I mean, it does this, not invents this. You, you well, it depends. You have to trust your firmware, right? 
because it's firmware is telling that basically via the EFI variable which is exported to the kernel and and kernel exports that to the user space as a special <laughs> file system. So if you don't trust your machine vendor use, I guess you are screwed anyway, right? Whatever you I do. Mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, all this, all this trouble, just to still have to trust something. Yes, of course, you have to trust your firmware vendor and your hardware vendor. If you don't trust Intel and there are easier ways to open hardware. Hmm? There are easier ways to open hardware. You shouldn't be ever using. What? There's easier ways to open hardware than using any of this. If you really want to, if you don't trust Intel, they'll screw you. Yeah. If you don't trust Intel, then running anything on the processor is a loophole. Yes, of course, yeah. because so. because. I mean, I don't know what is running in system management mode. I, I can't tell, and system management mode can run basically any code, and even operating system doesn't know what is running. So if NSA has backdoor in, in Intel hardware, and some, some code is running in a system well, management mode. The problem may be in software, which, which you already have. You think that this is, it's only trusting these keys, and it shows you these keys, but, but you don't actually know it by when you type the letters. Of course. You didn't, you didn't check the, all the megabytes of code between you and the hardware, no. No, no. <laughs> so the, uh, we go through years and the, I don't know how many man, many years of development for what? For just additional pain in the hands? I don't necessarily agree because... <laughs> yes, you hit, a, you hit a big system like you have to trust your hardware vendor at some point. I mean, you are the secure boot is a protocol for building a chain of trust, and that chain of trust has a trust anchor. And if you don't trust your trust anchor, then I mean, write on your your own firmware and do your own hardware. I don't know. I mean, you have to trust somebody at at, at trust the end. Trust so, okay. yeah. So Question. Well, even if you fabricate your own hardware, there is so many people involved in the process. <laughs> Yes, of course, because you have to. You would have to also verify the compiler for VHDL or Verilog or something you are using yeah, to design your hardware. Software. 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 Your firmware vendor doesn't put backdoors in the firmware uh, on purpose. Then you can you can be sure that, for example, now, uh, even somebody hacks my machine and will run some malware under the root, it can't install uh, it, it can't install kernel modules without my permission. Basically, if I okay now I have signing keys on that machine, so I would have to, of course took signing keys to some other place, safe place, not to leave it on the machine. That's, that, that's of course, uh, just a demo setup we have here. But in a real life, you would have to secure your signing keys and then... Well, you have several hundreds of uh, kernel modules already. You never reviewed their, their source. Of course. Uh, and what they do. And may maybe one of them already has something. And they are all signed, so... Insert a module for your, I don't know, USB, USB key, keyboard, and opa, there is there is something you didn't know. Yes, of course, but you trust open source. I mean, if you don't trust anyone, then you don't have, you can't use any software today unless you write it, and even then, you don't have any 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 means to run it because you don't trust the platform where you run it. So. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You already trust your, your kernel, your modules. So w why why all of this? Why is this signing nonsense? Um, I I don't have secure boot here. I don't expect here to magically it, it, new modules to to appear with viruses. That's the trust so I, I have. 
and I don't think that's necessary. Why, why do, you, do you need these keys to have some additional? I, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing to to trust that you will be so lucky that you will never encounter any rootkit malware. I mean, you can trust that it never it will never happen to you, but you, you can take a measures to make sure that it never happens to you. So that's the thing, that's the point, right? Or, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, okay, so that was the demo. Let's go back to the slides. Uh, so yeah, I will try and summarize uh, some facts about the BIOS and also clarify what I mean when I say BIOS, firmware, UEFI, EFI and whatnot. So basically by legacy BIOS, I will be, uh, I will be addressing a type of the firmware which was pioneered basically uh, by IBM and it was standard in all IBM PCs since like late, uh, early 80s, early 80s basically. Uh, so yeah, uh, and actually the interesting fact I discovered when I was doing the research for this, the, uh, this workshop that IBM wasn't, IBM PC wasn't the first computer which used like BIOS-like firmware uh, there is this sort of exotic and very old operating system, CP, uh, CPM, which was running on a computer which actually had something like BIOS, bio, uh, IBM BIOS firmware even before, uh, before that. So maybe IBM took some inspiration from, from that. I, I don't know. I just mentioned it on the slides as interesting fact. So yeah, so IBM pioneered this concept of, of uh, of BIOS as, as we as we uh, know it, uh, then a couple other vendors uh, implement basically the same thing. They reverse uh, reverse engineered what IBM was shipping on their computers and implemented similar set of features, similar set of interfaces. Uh, BIOS is quite old actually. Uh, it is here from from late seventies. 280s and up to late 90s, basically, and even today you can you can see computers which use uh, which use uh, like <coughs> legacy BIOS, non UEFI based uh, BIOSes. Uh, problem with the BIOS is that uh, it is written in assembly, and if you if you want to extend it, you can buy some license from from some some vendor like Avard BIOS, Emi BIOS, couple other vendors are around. So you can you can buy license. They will probably give you the source code like assembly, assembly yeah, in assembly, and you have to extend it also in assembly. Uh, the execution environment is not that great. I mean, it's running in uh, 16 bit uh, real mode, and it you can address like one megabyte of, of memory, and that that's it pretty much. I mean, there, there, there are different implementations, different vendors these days, so it's hard to generalize, but, well, that's, that's probably the, the limitations which apply to almost all of them, basically. So, what actually BIOS does, so you reset your machine, then after the reset, CPU will start executing uh, some code defined by reset vector uh, that will probably do some, some basic uh, CPU in initialization and then it will run something called post, uh, power on self-test. Basically it will initialize chipset, main memory, video adapters, uh, other hardware you have like PCI, PCI subsystem, USBs, uh, USB these days and whatnot. Then it will it will continue with boot device selection, and then if you are lucky and you have some something you can boot from, it will actually load the OS loader or operating system. Basically, these days on Linux machine, it it will usually load grub uh, or part of the grub, which then will load grub, uh, and. Usually it includes setup utility, where you can do some basic system configuration, uh, configuring 
hardware subsystems, stuff like that. Uh, okay, so problems. I already mentioned that execution environment is not that great. Uh, problems, uh, other problems are that BIOS doesn't scale r really well. Um, Intel engineers in in uh, late 90s, late 90s, when they were designing uh, Itanium platform, uh, they uh, they uh, basically saw that uh, there are issues of running really primitive, sort of primitive code, basically on a new 64-bit machine, which Itanium is or or, or was, and so that BIOS just doesn't scale well on big iron machines like big servers, which was the plan with the yeah, Itanium. Uh, yeah, and it's proprietary. There are multiple vendors, but still, most of the, it, there is no open source implementation I know of. And there are no standard interfaces. So I have no idea how they, how they, how the vendors communicate or, or what they do, but I don't know. So I, I guess somebody implements something first, and then the other vendor com comes along and reverse engineers how how is that fun uh, functionality done, and does something similar. So now something about UEFI. So UEFI is also type of, type of the firmware, but it is not. It is not. Uh, Legacy legacy BIOS code from from the vendors which were displayed on the previous slides. It is completely new thing, new implementation of the firmware. So why should you care? Uh, probably runs on your laptop. I don't know who doesn't have in this room laptop with UEFI. I guess almost everybody. Oh, everybody has. Uh, it's extensible and it is standardized. So actually, you, you're on your own. You can develop extensions to that firmware, and it's written in C. And another good thing is that uh, now we can see that some cooperation between OEMs and uh, industry vendors is. Uh, is formed basically they still compete with each other but at least they can sit around in one room and decide what they want in their basic platform so you take two completely different computers and you can be sure pretty much that at least what is in the UEFI spec will work on both of them and it doesn't doesn't really matter who who the, of who manu, who is the manufacturer so yeah bit of a history about EFI and UEFI so UEFI stands for unified extensible firmware interface and its predecessor was EFI that, that is the thing which Intel Intel people wanted for their itanium platform so in late 90s they they developed EFI which eventually evolved in uh, evolved into uh, UEFI. Uh, that is the name of the specification, as well as industry standardization body behind the specification. So it is formed by uh, by big companies, by big vendors, and it has different uh, work groups which then have some subgroups and each group is responsible for part of the specification and from time to time get, they get around, get together and uh, release a new version of the spec and the newest version is 2.6 from January of this year. So <coughs> UEFI based firmware uh, goes through the different steps while basically booting your machine. So I will briefly, very briefly cover what those steps are. Maybe some of you already seen this picture because it's used so many times, but it has been used so many times, but I think it really captures what are the main main phases of the of the system boot in, in, a, in a firmware which is based on uh, UEFI. 
So, so we will start uh, here with the first phase, which is called SEC or security phase. This is the, so basically one, uh, once the machine is powered on, it will jump into some code which basically verifies uh, from uh, where the uh, firmware itself is stored. It, it verifies the integrity of the ROM. Then we transition to uh, PEI phase, which is pre-EFI -EF initialization phase. And in that phase, we are still running uh, from ROM out of flash execution. We don't have any main memory. Uh, so we use, um, so that, that code which is running is part assembly and some part already in C. Uh, it has to use uh, CPU caches as, as ROM on Intel platforms. I'm not sure what ARM-based platforms do. Uh, Maybe well, it can be done both ways. You can lock either caches on ARM, mm -hmm. so essentially you lock the dcache, and then you use that for stack. Uh, on Intel, you always use the lock CPU caches. On MIPS uh, and ARM, you can also use SRAM if you have that option in the CPU. It's not necessarily there. It's optional. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically every platform uses what is available and that locking will be... Locking caches is harder than using the on-chip SRAM. Hmm? So if locking caches is actually harder than the on-chip SRAM, mm -hmm. so if you have on-chip SRAM, you use that. Yeah. Because it's readily available there. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, but the, the main point of this phase is basically initialize uh, memory. We, programming without memory is hard, and that's why we, we want to have like main memory uh, available for the rest of the system boot. Uh, then we transition to then we transition to driver execution environment, uh, like it's Dixie phase, and in that phase, uh, bulk of the firmware code is basically running, the biggest portion of the firmware code is running in this phase. And in this phase we execute uh, Dixie, Dixie drivers which implement architectural protocols which are defined by uh, UEFI uh, platform init initialization <coughs> specification and then uh, we dispatch all uh, EFI drivers. And those drivers provide us with uh, EFI uh, or they implement EFI protocols, which we can then use in uh, in uh, applications. So uh, and then we transition to boot device selection phase, and then uh, we usually uh, we either start up some operating system loader or. Uh, we can load uh, basically operating system itself because Linux these days carries like EFI stub loader in, in, in a kernel. So kernel binary can can uh, basically masquerade or or trick firmware into thinking that it is itself EFI binary. So kernel uh, firmware can directly launch uh, Linux. If, if we don't want any, uh, any bootloader or OS loader. And EFI specification uh, basically only uh, covers this blue strip, UEFI interface. So that is the main interface to the, to the firmware. Uh, Okay, so I basically covered all this. So now, <coughs> now we have basic understanding what UEFI is, uh, how it roughly works. I mean, to describe it in detail, it's too much, too much work, and the specification, like the specification on the, of the interface, has almost 3,000 pages and there are a couple other specs so it is thousands and thousands of pages so I will I will be not not covering anything else because I don't think it makes uh, actually sense uh, to do is to do it here 
So are there any questions about about this part or comments? Please feel free. Go ahead. Is there a way how to boot the uh, 16 bits uh, code from the CPU to the CPU file? That's a good question. I have no idea. Maybe somebody else can uh, answer that. Uh, I actually never tried that, so I don't know. I can't tell. Uh, does somebody know if it is possible to, bit, to boot 16-bit code? I, I, I would be surprised, but... So, uh, well, well, why did you ask? Just out of curiosity, or you you have use case for this? Uh, use uh, such uh, maybe third party software, I don't know, and test or something similar. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I I don't know, I don't know. And another question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, where are the SPs for that for the in the UI file? Uh, is it subset or? Uh, what, please? S S oh, ACPI. A ACPI is like. It, I'll just. Uh, so. Uh, org specifications. So here are the, all the specifications which are produced by UEFI forum and ACPI specification is uh, separate from UEFI specification so but it is very very related or I mean it is produced by same group of people basically there is, is there something like uh, ACPI papers in the UEFI standard or is uh, or coexist together or I, I, I would say those two standards like Co coexist together, but uh, I don't know if that answers your question. We can. Uh, uh, <coughs> services time. I mean, I haven't really studied what's what's in the spec in the newest version. I actually found out that 2.6 was released like a month ago, so. But it doesn't seem they changed that much. It seems that it is basically the same thing and as it was before. Uh, yeah, but, but to answer your question, uh, ACPI is separate separate standard, so it is not it is not uh, described in in this document, but it is separate. You can. I'm, I'm asking because when I put my laptop in the UEFI mm -hmm. uh, mode, I can see the ACPI. Uh, I honestly don't know. Uh, no idea whether that's uh, mandatory or or uh, vendor extension. I can look for ACPI. Uh, there is a couple of matches. Calls position. Uh, yeah. So seems like the ACPI table uh, tables are uh, there is a protocol defined uh, de uh, defined by standard. In install ACPI table, uninstall are the methods of the or parameters. That that will be mandatory, I think. Okay, so now I will cover one specific protocol, uh, which is uh, Secure Boot. I picked Secure Boot because I think that there is a lot of 
uh, misinformation about secure boot in, in a Linux community and Linux users are sort of, I don't know, sensitive to that subject. So I, I picked it on purpose, sort of. So we can, we can discuss secure boot issues here. Uh, so yeah, so basically what secure boot is, secure boot is a protocol uh, described by chapter 30 of UEFI spec. And basically it is a protocol for building a trust relationship between between the components which are involved in a boot process. So it builds trust relationship from the firmware up to the operating system. And each component in that trust, in, in that chain of trust basically verifies the next next component in the in the chain. So that's that's in a nutshell uh, the main main idea and main concept. So to, to talk about uh, secure boot, we need to first understand that th there is uh, crypto involved and there are a couple of uh, key databases. So, <coughs> and those key, uh, those, I mean like keys in those databases are used to build that uh, trust relationship basically or they provide you with the way where you can verify the trust. So there are four, four main databases uh, described by uh, UEFI Secure Boot. First one is uh, PK, Platform Key. It is database which contains always only one key. Then you have KEK, Key Exchange Key, also database which contains only one key. Then you have DB, which is signature database uh, that may contain more keys or hashes. Uh, and then uh, database, the last one is DBX, and that is the that contains uh, basically keys which are uh, revoked. So it's a revoked uh, database of revoked keys or hashes, known hashes of a mouse. <coughs> So if, if the new malware, uh, which for example, uh, I don't know, like there, there is some attack against uh, Microsoft uh, bootloader, Windows bootloader, they can release a new version, a patched version, and they can enroll a hash of the old one in the database. And that means that platform firmware will never, will never boot that, uh, or will never run that code, uh, I mean, anymore. So that's, that's the point of the, the DBX database. Uh, and in those databases, uh, these days, I mean, the, the spec says that there are multiple options what can be stored there, but basically almost every vendor these days and every, platform, uh, every firmware implementations I encountered uh, supports X509 certificates with RSA, RSA keys or a uh, SHA-256 uh, hashes. Uh, so this is the, uh, this is the diagram which, uh, which, this, <coughs> which, show, uh, which shows you which uh, secure boot mode actually exists. In the demo you saw that I started here with, in the setup mode. And in setup mode, I can basically uh, run whatever I want. Secure boot is effectively disabled. And then I enrolled, enrolled keys and I transitioned into user mode. So in that mode, secure boot is, uh, secure boot is enabled and enforced. So we will check signatures and we will build the trust relationship and we will actually uh, Refuse to refuse to boot unsigned code, and there are a couple. Uh, there are two other modes. Uh, I will not bother uh, describing what uh, for what is audit mode, uh, but deployed mode could be. Uh, it it can be said that it is the most secure mode, so you can transition from the user mode to the deployed mode, and in that mode, 
be, uh, basically the EFI variables are uh, are read only. You can't change them unless you can't change them programmatically. You have to you have to be present at the machine and transition back to the user mode or uh, yeah transition back to the user mode and then you can programmatically change the keys or uh, you can also there is a platform specific way how you can see here a platform specific way how to how to transition from user mode to the setup mode a question where is the mode stored like if i change the mode to deploy it what position changes that i need from somewhere that's got that data in and VRAM. Oh, so it is exported then as EFI variable, basically. Which is stored in VRAM. So why haven't you just cleared the NVRAM? Uh, I mean, the spec doesn't say where is, where is it stored. It says that what, uh, what, what are the requirements for storage? So I think at the end of the day, the fact where is it stored on the on the given machine it would be platform specific, but it has to comply with the requirements which are uh, given by the spec. So, for example, the database uh, must be tamper proof and st uh, stuff like that. And uh, I think you it it should survive that. Yes. So you are not supposed to uh, be able to do that, but well, that document is just a spec. So what actually gets to the end users, I mean, it's hard to tell. Uh, it would be nice if all the vendors uh, complied with the specification, but yeah. Oh, question. Uh, what I believe these secure bits are stored in the TPM chip, which are no longer TPM because it's part of chipset. Yeah. And this is a protection so that when someone actually has physical access to the machine, they can just pull out the TPM chip or something else in there and convert to security. Uh, at this point, you would have to actually decap the chipset and start digging it into a microscope, and then you can convert to security. That's why this sort of variables should be stored in your chipset. Uh, like I said, the, the spec itself doesn't doesn't uh, says where it should be stored. It puts some requirement on that storage. I believe you should check the management engine the documentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. That that's maybe the case. I I don't know. Uh, but I don't I don't recall that the spec itself says that. And so maybe some other document has more and more information on that for there like. There's a lot of documentation from Intel and all this stuff. So. Yeah. Okay, so those are those are the modes, and now uh, as for the benefits from my point of view, that's sort of open for discussion if you may may ag agree or not. But so yeah, so like I said, chain of trust from the firmware to the OS uh, should protect you from the boot kits. No unsigned code running in the kernel and only signed drivers are loaded, so more or less no root kits, basically. Uh, yeah, doesn't, doesn't, uh, yeah, so there are risk involved as well. Uh, so on most machines, that chain of trust include third parties. So it's not only you and, uh, and uh, manufacturer of your machine, but typically Microsoft, because uh, your laptop probably has Windows, uh, Windows 8 sticker on it, or maybe Windows 10 these days. And Microsoft mandates that if manufacturer wants to put Windows sticker on their laptop, it has to have Microsoft has to have uh, uh, their keys in a firmware by default, and secure boot must be enabled. Can I delete those keys? Yes, of course you uh, you can. So secure boot actually, and that is another thing which is not mandated by the specification, but this is mandated by Microsoft. 
uh, can't be disabled on the ARM-based devices with, with Windows 8 and uh, newer. So, yeah, on Intel-based hardware, we are fine. We, are, we can still run whatever we want. Basically, we throw away uh, keys which are provided by the vendor. We install our own keys, Red Hat key, Fedora key, and we can run whatever we want. But on ARM, we are sort of out of luck because there's no way how to how to turn off secure boot. So if you if you buy I don't know tablet with Windows uh, 10, uh, then you can't can't disable or shouldn't be able to disable uh, secure boot. I can't really imagine that Microsoft would allow uh, such such devices to be sold to the end customers if the manufacturer doesn't comply, but I, I don't know. I, I w wasn't very like actively looking for cases where this is actually not the case. Uh, so yeah, uh, doesn't, Secure Boot doesn't prevent infection of your machine from, from malware. Like, this is not what it does. You can still have your machine hacked even have, have, if you have Secure Boot enabled. It's just that the hacker will probably be not able to inject any code to the kernel. Uh, I mean, via the measures of loading kernel modules. He can, of course, uh, trigger some, uh, some, uh, some bug in kernel via other means and possibly inject code uh, this way. Do you sign the NRD as well? No. Uh, no, it is going up to the level of the operating system, and not to the anti uh, to the uh, applications. That's the line. That's the line. Yes. So if you have your initramfs, uh, or if your initramfs was tampered with, uh, you are again out of luck, and Secure Boot will not will not save you because the problem with initramfs is that. Uh, it is generated at install time. Mm -hmm. When you are installing Fedora as the last step of installation, there are post uh, scriptlets, uh, post trans uh, scriptlets running, and then uh, as as part of the post installation process, uh, in initramfs is generated, so it can't be signed by by Fedora or Red Hat. So initramfs is not signed these days. Uh, there is. Uh, some work going on to address that. Uh, Harald Hoyer is working on pre-generating of InidramFS and storing hashes of the of InidramFS and uh, and kernel command line hashes to TPM. So system then can be re uh, so system then can do remote attestation and prove to the other party that it really booted with the kernel command line parameters it was supposed to boot with. Because of course you can, you don't even have to like really change in in RD. If you are pre present at the machine, you can just say in it equals bin sh, and you don't have to do anything else to take over the machine basically. So once we have uh, we have a possibility to do remote attestation. Uh, secured by TPM, then we will be we will be able to tell that okay, if I have this setup in my environment, in my organization, those machines are uh, can't be can't be subverted uh, this uh, this way because hashes of the of the kernel command line will be stored in TPM and then it will do remote attestation to a server. So, also th there are problems if you are running uh, with Secure Boot enabled. Uh, currently on Fedora, I don't know about uh, policies in other distros what they do, but in Fedora, uh, Direct IO to Def KMEM is disabled. Then writing to a machine specific registered via MSR uh, kernel module is not supported. Also. If you want to, 
so k exec is also disabled, and that implies k dump is also uh, disabled. So yeah, I mean in enterprise environment, it's not not that great because k dump tool is used a lot, and k dump uses k exec functionality. That there is a, so if your basically if your kernel crashes, there is a separate kernel which will be which will be. Uh, K exact and it can then collect some uh, more information about the crash and those information then can help support engineers. Yes? Isn't there a new kernel function for like half a year that where the old kernel directly loads the new kernel and so can do it in a secure compromised way? Yes, that that may be the case. I I saw patches on, on kernel mailing list but they, are, they got merged like half a year ago, I think. Ah, okay but then. Maybe it's not used yet. No, I, I don't think it's used in... Uh, so basically I'm here describing Fedora setup, but it is good to know that patches upstream has been merged. So yeah, so KDAMP will be, uh, will be usable then. So, and, that, and that's good. Thanks. Okay. And what about third party kernel modules, like VMware tools or drivers? Uh, after you update the kernel, you will regenerate it. Who will sign it? Well, so I just reboot and I will have no network. Uh, so yeah, I mean, with the security features and security, uh, it's always a trade-off, right? So th there is some more work involved. <coughs> so basically, if you have third-party modules which are already signed, I, <coughs> me on my own laptop, I don't have any hardware which requires those. So I didn't dealt with this problem myself. Like personally, so but I would I would think it is possible to strip the signature from the uh, from the from whoever is delivering the module. I mean Nvidia, VMware, whoever, and then uh, resign it with your own key, and then you can load it. I mean it's a hack, but it can be done, and yeah. So I think that there is no other way. If somebody. If somebody knows about some other way how to do that more effectively, please speak up because I don't. So can you sign the module with one key at a time? I think so. And also in Fedora, uh, hibernation is uh, disabled, but again, I personally don't use that, so it doesn't bother me. Does suspend work? That's the suspend, basically. Hiberna hiberna hibernation and suspend. Uh, I mean, suspend to RAM. Yeah. That works. So that, that is suspend to, uh, suspend to disk, sorry. So <coughs> now, as for the demo. Okay, so in demo I showed you at the beginning, uh, basically those are the steps I, I did, or I have a script which did those steps. So basically, uh, if you want, you can, uh, you can check in a secure boot demo folder. So this is the script. And these are the, basically the steps it does. So first thing, it checks some parameters that's not interesting. Then it will generate some random UUID unless it is already provided in a in a in a file uh, like owner uh, GUID. Uh, then we basically using OpenSSL generate uh, RSH keys and X509 certificates then then we convert those certificates to the form which can be then used by uh, or can be enrolled in, into the firmware it's called 
EFI signature list. So it is, you can imagine that it is like, uh, like the certificate is very concrete thing and, uh, and standard says that you can enroll a couple other things except the certificates in a firmware. So on top of the certificate, you have uh, that EFI uh, signature list, which basically encapsulates the certificate in our case, but it can, it can uh, encapsulate a couple other things like uh, uh, standard hashes. Uh, again, a specification is very, very con uh, concrete. Uh, what, what, can be, what can be stored in a EFI signature list? And then basically what we do, we sign, we sign the signature, uh, we sign the signature list. And the signing is done here. It is a bit of a hack, but in a, in a real life, it would work that you have your, so you, you generate your own, uh, your own platform key. And once you enroll that, you are the platform owner, basically. That is the that is the sort of the meaning of the of that key. Who whoever has that key enrolled is platform owner. So in a, in a default setup, OEM basically owns your machine because the key belongs to the OEM. So if you change that key, then you become the platform owner. And then all the other keys in key databases I, uh, I showed you uh, before, like CAC, DB, and DBX, can be changed by you. And the way you do that is you have to, you have to generate, like out, it's called authenticated updates to those key databases. And the key databases, uh, I mean, keys in those databases can be updated always by the updates, which has been signed by the key from the database, which is above the database. So the, as, we, as was it on a slide, first we had PK, then we had CAC, then we had DB. So this is the hierarchy. I mean, you have your own PK, you own the platform, then you can generate authenticated update to CAC database and you can basically append to, uh, you, you can basically uh, change the key in a CAC database. So, uh, or add, add the key to the CAC database and you sign with the platform key. And then if you want to change key in a DB database, that would be the key you are using for signing, for example, your own kernels or your own EFI applications you will sign that update to the DB database with the key in CAC database. So that's the hierarchy. So what happens if we own the key in the DBX? Uh, excuse me, what if happens? If we own the key in the, key in the DBX database? What happens? Uh, I mean, DB and DBX database are like top uh, at, the, at the bottom, so there are no other databases be below them basically. So you always have to sign updates to the DB and DBX with the CAC key. But in the reality, as you can see in that script, uh, I, I le left it there for the demonstration purposes. I basically, I am signing all the keys with the PK, with the, with the platform key. So you should sign the DB key with the CAC key and CAC key with the, uh, with the PK key, but you can, you can, and it, it is even allowed by the specification, uh, you can sign everything with the PK key. Uh, it is... So I guys that the vendors will uh, certify the keys for uh, uh, OS vendors and so on, so that was the idea originally. I don't know, Dell or whoever will sign the keys for the, uh, for the Red Hat or someone? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I don't know pretty much what was the, like, the story behind, uh, behind this uh, idea. But 
if you if you don't have your own keys, like uh, imagine that you bought a brand new machine and PK key, and for example, it's Lenovo. So in Lenovo case, PK key, PK key is owned by Lenovo, and then in a CAC database, the one below, uh, you have Lenovo key and Microsoft key. And in DB, you have Microsoft key. And then, if you want to run uh, some, some binary, you either disable secure boot, or you have to run something which is signed by Microsoft or Lenovo basically. Yeah. And Microsoft provides you uh, with the, they, they provide certification service, uh, I, sorry, not certification, signing. They provide signing service and for example, if uh, you want to have your binary signed by Microsoft, you would have to deliver the binary and source code to them. They will do some security checks on, on their source code and after a couple of weeks and once you pay them i guess 200 dollars i'm not i'm not sure they will sign your binary and then you can run it on your own machine so yeah so ba basically keys are enrolled in a firmware and then whoever owns the keys uh, have to provide a way how to sign binaries with those keys, basically. And by default, uh, Microsoft has keys installed in every, every laptop, and then, uh, and then uh, Microsoft can sign uh, binaries it wants, and those can, can be run on, on, uh, on such laptop. I mean, uh, in Fedora, default Fedora, setup is a bit different from what I showed here and it uses sort of a hack uh, to the spec. I mean they, they use extra database which they call MOK, uh, machine owner keys. This is like a separate database implemented by the tool. Uh, default, in default Fedora there is a tool called Shim and that Shim tool is basically, it, it has been uh, signed by Microsoft and then firmware will launch the shim tool and then that shim tool knows how to, how to basically find the grub binary and, uh, and link the grub. And then it will jump to the grub code, then grub, you, you will see the, the grub then, and before it jumps to the grub, it will, it will verify that uh, grub is signed with the Fedora key. And the public uh, part of embedded in a shim binary. So it is like a weird setup. I mean, shim is, shim is signed by Microsoft. Then inside shim, there is a public part of a key which Fedora uses to sign grub and kernel. Uh, then shim links the grub, jumps, into the, uh, jumps to that code before that verifies that binary is properly signed. Then you will see grub menu and before you before you see actually the menu, Grub will find the, all the kernel binaries according to your configuration, and it will ask back Shim, "Hey, please verify the signature on that kernel on that kernel uh, binary, because uh, Grub itself doesn't contain any crypto code, so it calls back to the Shim to verify. Please please check the signature on this kernel binary." And that's, I mean, I don't think that's particularly good design, but I know that there are that there are like use cases which they want to support. For example, uh, dual booting windows, uh, which I don't care about personally. And maybe that's a, that's what I uh, what I didn't mention yet. I mean, if you have your if you have your own keys and Fedora key, for example, like a, in a, setup I showed you, you are basically, and secure boot is enabled, you can't boot windows because firmware will refuse because windows, uh, windows bootloader and windows, uh, windows kernel are not signed by, uh, by your own keys or Fedora keys. So that is, that is the one thing I should emphasize that using the setup I showed you, you will not be able to dual boot. So if you want to dual boot, 
please use default Fedora setup. But that require that I mean, it is what it is. So for example, that uh, shim I am talking about, it contains, it bundles like crypto libraries, like OpenSSL for, for verification of the signatures. And then, like I told you, grab calls back to the shim and shim does verification, returns back to the, to the grab and then grab can continue in a boot process, basically. So you have firmware itself contains crypto code because it has to, to do verification of signatures and then shim contains crypto code. So you have two layers where things can go wrong. So if you, if you don't care about Windows and you don't care about other operating systems, uh, care about, only care about Linux, then you can use the setup I showed you and you can get, get rid, of the, rid of the shim layer. How do uh, you update your file? Uh, sorry? Well, we have files updates yep. on the older machines. Your file is just a new kind of bias. You want to update it when the vendor discovers that they have bugs there. So they check it with their, their APK team, right? Yeah. So you shouldn't delete it if you want to ever update your file firmware. Uh, that's actually a good question. I think that's the case, yes. You would have to disable secure boot. Uh, in, a, in a setup utility, you usually have a flag enable disable so for a firmware update you would have to disable it because usually firmware updates are done uh, via some application which vendor delivers to you uh, yeah you will know about that <laughs> well if it's signed with the day or pk key you don't, don't need to disable security yeah so that that's what i'm and you can't you can't run such binary if you have only your own keys so you would have to disable secure boot for that time, time period, run the binary which was the, uh, given to you by, by uh, a firmware vendor, update the firmware and then enable secure boot back. So Unless you signed a firmware update yourself? Yeah, m maybe you can do that. I, I didn't try it, so it's I'm not. not <laughs> <laughs> so question in the back. Yeah. That is my understanding. Uh, that you, uh, if you do some changes to the shim code, you will have to deliver that new code to the Microsoft certification service to re uh, to to sign to sign by Microsoft. Which takes about two weeks. So yes, that that, that, that takes time. Yes. Well, it's a very small amount of code, so you know that's what you want is something very small that's not yeah, going to have a lot of issues. That's, yes, that's the case. And another question, you said that group is calling into the shim to get yes. verification services? Yes, so shim. Just call directly into the UEFI? Uh, shim establishes another, like shim implements its own UEFI protocol, which is then used by Grub, because UEFI API doesn't have like top level API, please verify signature. It has API, uh, basically what uh, systemd boot is using is UEFI API called load image. And in a process <laughs> of loading that image, the signatures are verified in case secure boot is enabled, but there is no API to actually just uh, verify a signature. Okay. So Shim itself implements own, it extends UEFI firmware. It's a good example how you can actually extend the, the, the API which firmware provides you. Just look at the uh, shim code and you will see how they, how they do that, how they extend and provide their own API for grub to call back. Thank you. Yeah. So what happens if I verify a signature and the image is a change the image and then load it? So, so you do what? You verify the signature? Yeah, mod probe. Mod probe reads in the module in the memory and then make a 
system call load the image. Mm -hmm. So the loading is checking the in the signature and then loads the. So what if this? this so you are is suggesting that this uh, this scheme is vulnerable to time of check, time of use bugs in a mod probe. Yes. And you are probably right. I mean. Yeah, I guess I never checked the mod probe code, but so you use module signing to get around that. But what you are suggesting is that I check the signature and then I load the module, and in in the in the in that very short time window between I I do check and then load, somebody would somehow, but he, he would he would have to well, would hack it. your kernel anyway because how no, how they go to kernel mod pro. I have a mod pro by fork and another thread, which is just touching. Yes, the, but, I, but if you, so you if just you need to read the module and the memory first and then validate the signature because you yes. have to validate the contents of the module. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would have to have. Uh, so it's lo the module is loaded first. Yes. And yes. Then the module is validated. Yes. And the code that is already validated is then inserted into the kernel. Yes. Oh. At this moment, you can change it. No, no, you no, can't. No. Why? Because because, because, attack write it that way. <laughs> because I mean. attacker would have to break like uh, the memory management subsystem of the Linux kernel, right? To oh. hack into the mod probe, uh, like he would have to attack or somehow get into the mod probe process. Uh, to to change the memory mod probe already. No, said so this, so mod this, probe. This thing is not protecting you against user space attacks. So we can we we, we are don't we are not protecting <coughs> mod probe code. Mod probe code is malicious. We we assume this. That's fine because mod probe code just pumps some sort of binary into the kernel space and then the binary which is pumped into the kernel space is basically off limits to the user. It cannot be changed. When it's in the kernel space, you verify the cryptographic signature and then you insert it. There's no way the user can actually change the module. Okay, so it's copied to the kernel and that'll be fine. Okay. Make sense? Okay. So some more questions? Matzo? So so for clarification, so in your setup, not using Shim, you write your key directly to the page uh, uh, yes, yes, you, you... So you rewrite the original key? Yes, Lenovo key is not anymore there. Uh, you would have to download Lenovo key or back up the Lenovo key before you delete it. So you would have to read the contents of that EFI variable basically, what, what actually it is right now put it somewhere. Is it possible to have just one platform key? Yes, it is possible to have just one platform key. So not, it's not really a database, it's a place for one key. A uh, platform key is for one key, and then all the others are, you can have multiple keys. Okay, so, so you write, I'm the, so hmm? you write uh, the, the platform key, and then you have CAC, right? Yes, and so in CAC database you can have multiple keys. So uh, when you write your own key there, you, if you add it, and uh, the Microsoft key still is there, or? Uh, it can be there if you want to. But you can remove it? You can remove it, yes. Okay. So it can be there if you want to, and even in a DB database you can leave the Microsoft keys, yeah. so and then, I, then you would be able to dual boot. Yeah, okay. Just so what, what I should. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So and, you don't, and you don't need uh, to use him then? No. No, but the setup I showed you, which you have only your own keys yeah, okay. and Fedora key, uh, you are not able to dual boot because you are not able to start Windows bootloader. But, but, but then why using Shim when you can have those two keys there and, and <sighs> I mean, that's the question for people who implemented the scheme in Fedora. I, okay. I mean, they wanted to use Grub. That's, that's the one thing, I guess. Grub is the default bootloader in Fedora and it would be very hard to get rid of that and I don't know so I guess maybe the story starts there that their requirement was to use grub. Yeah, okay, well, that makes sense. Question? Yes, a quick question. Can I sign a Windows folder with my key? 
<laughs> you can sign whatever you want. So basically... So when with your setup, I'm able to boot Windows if I sign? Like they yes, sign. if you take that binary, uh, the, there is a specification where those keys are placed in a binary. So you just find it, take it out, and put something else there. You compute the, compute the hash, sign it, and put it to the binary again. Uh, no, no, the, as far as I understand, hash to com is computed uh, in a way that... It's the that inside of the signing envelope. Yes, no, key, key is not part of, the, of that computation. Okay. So you basically compute the hash, you sign it, and then you, then you put it, uh, signed hash, in, into that binary. So I, 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 I can resign my kernel, basically. It's by default signed by Fedora key, so I throw it away, sign it with my own key, and I can, I can boot it then. Okay, so, yeah, so basically we sign the keys, uh, sign the, uh, yeah, sign the uh, signature lists, and then we enroll them into the firmware. And then once we enroll here at the bottom, PK, platform key, that automatically takes the platform to the user mode. It should. It actually doesn't. You have to reboot. And that's probably a bug in the firmware. Uh, because, or maybe it does, but it doesn't tell you. Maybe bug in kernel. I don't know. I would have to check. Because if I run boot CTL, it tells me that secure boot is disabled and platform is in setup mode, I guess, but it really should say that secure boot is actually enabled and a platform is in uh, user, user mode once we get to here. Okay, so we already talked, uh, talked about uh, alternatives, how you can, how you can uh, implement uh, secure boot. So actually, you don't have to you don't have to use any bootloader. You can you can just sign your kernel and use EFI firmware to to load the kernel directly. There is a EFI variable called uh, boot order, and whatever is defined in that variable will be at least tried by the firmware. And if you define a path to your kernel, which will be on the EFI system partition. Then, then it you can boot basically without the bootloader. Then there is a grub plus shim approach we discussed, and there is one more thing uh, which is related to grub plus shim approach, and that is the tools made by James Bottomley, uh, the SCSI maintainer uh, in kernel. He all he also does secure boot things and and EFI stuff, so he sort of did a hack where they have separate key database called MOK, they install key there, and then they do very weird thing, which is sort of, it is, uh, as far as I know, it is not standardized and it is like a hack, but it works. And the point is that they override uh, something called uh, EFI architect security architecture protocol and they install their own hook into that. So basically they hook, they, they chain another key database into that, into that chain. So basically if the key is not in PK, not in CAC, not in DB, it will, it will try MOK as well. So they have like, I don't know, it's couple line of assembly, uh, but it is a hack, and so far, as far as I know, it is not it is not standardized. It is not allowed by standard to do such hacks. But they tried it, and it worked. They claim that everyone is using basically the Intel implementation of UEFI. Only ASUS is doing their own thing, and they also tried uh, well hardware with the ASUS uh, firmware, and it worked everywhere. So. They, they do that. I mean, they invented their own database and and install that override into the protocol, so that database is also checked. Uh, I don't know. Up to the up to you to decide what you think about it. 
so now UEFI development. So very quickly, uh, the main thing you need is if you want to experiment with all the stuff we talked about. So you should get uh, EDK2 uh, installed on your machine. So EDK stands for EFI Development Kit. Uh, there is a here is the repo. If you just add that repo, or if you are on Fedora, CentOS, or uh, RHEL. Uh, if you are on Ubuntu, uh, I guess you just have to unpack RPM and copy the files to the correct destinations. So, uh, so that is the repo, and from that repo you can ins install the install that package. That package actually contains uh, binaries for UEFI firmware for open source implementation of the UEFI firmware, which uh, lives on uh, which actually lives on GitHub. And the guy, uh, Kraxel, he actually runs Jenkins instance against the Git, so you can you can have basically firmware built every day. Uh, so fresh, so you can experiment with the fresh, uh, <coughs> fresh uh, master. May not work uh, from time to time. It depends. Uh, so couple other things. If you are using UEFI, you should. Uh, you should have your disk formatted in a way that it uses GPT partition table. I mean, there is no reason not to use GPT. Uh, MBR is terrible. You can have three or four partition at most, and they they are small. So you should use GPT. I mean, all the standard tools provides that functionality. So F disk, CF disk, whatever you are using all provides a uh, possibility to, to use GPT instead of, instead of uh, DOS uh, partition table. Then, uh, then you basically create uh, one partition, which will be your boot partition, and you format it as FAT32. Uh, that is mandated by the firmware uh, specification. Uh, and you mount it somewhere. I recommend and what uh, in the image is done is you don't specify anything in FFstab and you let system D do its magic. It will discover that you are using GPT partition table. It will figure out which partition is, your, is supposed to be your boot partition and it will mount it automatically. So you don't do anything, system D will do it for you. Then you can use a uh, bootloader I showed you, so I really recommend using systemd boot. It's very lightweight bootloader, uh, two thousand lines of C code basically to implement basic funct functionality of, of, well, I don't know, who uses grub for anything else than just booting their laptop? Okay, one guy, so then systemd boot is probably not for you. <laughs> but for everybody else on the laptop setup, I don't see a way why should I bother with grub. Can you document that process? Because I actually tried to switch fairly recently, and I was able to succeed, but I know quite a bit about this technology. Oh. I don't think anyone that is not uh, would be able to switch to, uh, to it uh, yeah, that's from, from grub. And it's not even packaged in Fedora, so. Okay, uh, I mean, you, you mean systemd boot? Yeah. It is part of systemd RPM. It's not built. It is? I checked the binary. User lib system D boot EFI uh, path. I mean, I can. Oh, this was a, this was a while ago, so maybe it was. So uh, maybe okay, so old, I might have had an old package, but yeah, maybe. So try try Fedora twenty three rawhide. It should be there. Okay. If not, file a bug. It should okay. be there. Uh, so once you have that. Uh, like once you have systemd boot, which everybody should have because it's packaged in systemd, you should have top level tool uh, boot CTL, and with that you can do nice things like status, uh, install the bootloader, and uh, you can install, uh, also for the development purposes, I recommend installing EFI shell, but uh, these days uh, the firmware itself embeds shelf in, its, uh, in itself. So basically you don't need to have separate shell binary. It is in a firmware by default. 
and you can run it from the from the setup utility menu. Uh, it is like boot device menu, and in there is a sub menu where you pick EFI shell. In a image I I provided you, uh, there is a separate shell binary installed, so you can you can play with that. Uh, so the actual firmware firmware implementation itself is at that uh, GitHub uh, GitHub account Tiano Core uh, slash EDK2. Tiano is an old name Intel used for for that stuff. I mean legacy. Uh, not, these days it's like it should be named like. Intel slash EDK2, but doesn't matter. Uh, and to actually do some EFI development, you need really basic tools. You need just GCC, make, and bin tools, and that's pretty much it. You don't need anything else. And GNU EFI uh, devel package. So here's really simple Hello World application, where I would like to show you a couple of differences between between the normal C Hello World and Hello World for EFI. Uh, so as you can see, the main function is called a bit differently. It's called EFI underscore main convention. Uh, EFI, uh, it takes a couple of parameters. So it, it's two of them. EFI handle to image. So basically, uh, it is a data structure basically describing the application itself when it is running. And then system table. Uh, in the table, there are a couple of function pointers to basic protocols like output. As you can see here, console output. Uh, it is from that sysstub uh, sys uh, structure. So that is the, that is the pointer to, to the protocol. Uh, we can see that then the protocol is used here. So and we, are, we will be calling a method of that protocol output string with two arguments, uh, this pointer basically, and the, the actual uh, string we want to, we want to print. Uh, yeah, you can see here that I'm using L prefix because all the strings in UEFI applications are basically UTF-16. That's unfortunate, but it is what it is. I mean, the standard itself was designed in 90s, and I guess back then UTF-8 was not that popular. So they went what they had. Uh, okay, so, so development environment, like I said, very simple, GNU make, binutils. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you see here that I am calling basically this function, but I am not calling the function uh, directly, even though I have pointer to that to that map, to that EFI uh, function. I'm calling this function via the UEFI call wrapper uh, because UEFI uses different calling convention as GCC by default, and that wrapper will provide you with the with the correct calling convention for the correct uh, for the current target so basically uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter whether you are compiling for 32 or 60 feet, uh, 64 bit code if you use this wrapper uh, it will do just the right thing depending on the target uh, so yeah i mentioned ucs two things so that's basically utf16 with minor differences for the most part, it's a UTF-16. Uh, yeah, and there's no standard library, basically. You can't use memcopy. The, the, there are routines in GNU EFI package. That there are libraries you can use. You, you have to look in the header file to, to see what's there. Uh, API is, it, it is, it resembles Windows APIs, like the, conventions for the code. It is camel case and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's not that nice, I would say, as, as standard C APIs we deal with every day, but whatever. Uh, it is what it is. And yeah, so for a more complex example, you can actually 
look at the code of bootloader uh, we, we used uh, in our demos. I really, really recommend uh, looking at that code because it uses different uh, protocols like output, graphics, and stuff like that. So, and it is very short. It is a couple, maybe 2,000 lines of code, of C code. So you can, you can uh, get the feeling how would you go about implementing non-trivial EFI application, and it's not that hard. Yeah, and I'm out of time, and that's pretty much it. So thank you for your time. And I was I was told to <laughs> hand <laughs> scarves for questions. So I guess Richard will get one. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Hmm? Oh, so we have two spare uh, tickets to the party. Who doesn't have ticket to the party and wants to go there? <laughs>